Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah 7. That verse reference is actually wrong. It should say 7-1 through 8-8. Eight, eight. But tonight we're just going to start by reading the first nine verses of chapter 7. It's turned into one of those part one, part two things. So It was either that or keep you here for two hours. So. Yes. Huh. <laughs> Your Pentecostalism shows up in the strangest places. <laughs> Isaiah 7, let's read 1 through 9. This is now the word of God. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have camped in Ephraim. His heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son Shear Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it, and make for ourselves a breach in its walls, and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Now within another sixty-five years, Ephraim will be shattered, so that it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening again to honor you and to worship you and to praise you and exalt you. Lord, you are so worthy of it. It's our duty, it's our calling, but it's also our desire. We want to bring you the praise that pleases you. And Lord, you've taught us so much about the condition of our heart. And Lord, we know that even on our best day, we come as unworthy worshipers. On our best day, we come as idolatrous men. We come as those who are bent towards sin. We come as those with an eye for the world. We come as those who are faithless and, Lord, who stumble and trip in iniquity. And, Lord, we come as impure in our thoughts and in all manner of ways. But, Lord, we come not only to worship but desiring that you would sanctify and cleanse and purge those things from us. We want to be pure worshipers, and the last thing we want to do is come bringing you some token or some outward religious symbol with our hearts being far away from you. And so, Lord, we come as honest as we know how to study your word and ask you to continue your sanctifying work, to continue cleansing us and molding us and shaping us to be the people you desire us to be, worshipers that please you, that you might take delight in what you see and hear in our lives and certainly when we gather together for corporate worship. Father, we know that the agent of your sanctification is certainly your Holy Spirit, but it is also your word. Jesus, you washed them with the water of the word, and that's what we're asking for tonight, that you wash us and that you transform us and that you renew our minds. And so as we study, God, we, we beg and plead with you for understanding, for clarity. It does us no good to have a wrong interpretation of your word, and so we pray that you help us understand it. I pray that you give me grace to make it clear. And Lord, then not just what it says or what it was written or why it was written, but Lord, we also pray for that added application to each art personally. We, we want to know from you about us, about me. And so Lord, we're praying for your spirit to confront us as we begin to talk about things like faith and trust. Lord, don't just teach us the value of faith and trust, but teach us also the areas in our life where we're not trusting, the areas in our life where, where faith is lacking. And may you then spur us on to believe you and trust you and be the people you've called us to be. So, Lord God, take your word and plant it deep in us. Guide us, teach us, cleanse us, confirm us, encourage us, all of these things which your word accomplishes. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we start a new segment, Isaiah chapter 7. And this new segment is actually Isaiah 7 through Isaiah 12. 
It's a six-chapter segment that all works together. When we get to chapter 13, we're going to return to Isaiah's woes as he again begins to pronounce woes and oracles against surrounding nations. But 7 through 12 works together as one segment. What I'm going to tell you as we get started here, we're going to spend a little bit of time this this evening just sort of introducing this segment and hoping that I can be clear enough to give you a grasp of the sort of that umbrella look of what this segment's about. Um, It's always dangerous to just fly off into a chapter when you really don't know the theme of the whole point. Uh, If you can't get that, then you're going to mess up the little pieces. So I want to try to clarify that. What I want you to understand before we even get into this chapter, because you're going to see a lot of stuff in 7 through 12, some of it that is very much relevant to the current day and some of it that still hasn't even happened yet. Uh, Some of it when we get like to chapter 11 and we start talking about the king sitting on the throne and the wolf dwelling with the lamb and the child playing near the cobra's den and, and some of these things that we have yet to see the fulfillment of these promises. So on one hand, you're going to have Isaiah speaking very directly to the people of his day. On another hand, you're going to have Isaiah speaking very directly to us. And yet at times, Isaiah is going to be speaking very directly to people who may not have even been born yet for a time yet future. And so it gets difficult sometimes to try to unweave and figure out who's he speaking to here. And the answer is that he's speaking to all of us. Many times, and we've used this analogy a lot, but you're familiar, that when the prophets saw what was coming, they saw it sort of in 2D instead of 3D. It's like we've talked about going to a mountain range. And, you know, we, we like to go to the mountains, the, the family and I, because, well, they're the mountains. What else do you need to know, right? And sometimes when you're getting close to those mountain ranges and you just see them like this, and you, you just see peak after peak after peak, but you don't see the distance between them. And that's the way the prophets looked at the future a lot of times. That they could see it. They could see the peaks, but they didn't always understand when. They didn't always understand the time period. They didn't always understand how it worked. In fact, listen to what Peter says about the prophets in 1 Peter 1. He says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Now what Peter said there was this salvation of God, God showed it to the prophets. God showed it to these men of old. God showed it to men like Isaiah. Clearly, there's so much about the coming salvation revealed in Isaiah's ministry. And it said that when God would show men like Isaiah these truths that were coming, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, these other prophets, would make careful searches and inquiries because what they wanted to know was when. When is this coming? Where is this mountain and where is this one? And and who is this and what's the time frame? And I see this coming, but when will he be here and what will it look like? And they made careful searches and really sought out God to try to gain clarity to what God had shown them. But according to Peter, the only answer God would ever give them was not to give them the specific day or the specific time or even to clarify maybe that valley between the mountains. The only thing God would show them is that this is not for you. They're not serving themselves. They're serving what Peter said was you. People on the other side of the gospel. You're serving them, not yourselves. That's what Peter says. It was revealed to them that they're not serving themselves but you. And it wouldn't be clear until after Christ came. And it wouldn't be clear until after the gospel was preached through the apostles. And then these things become clear to us now on the other side of the gospel message that weren't so clear to Isaiah. And I want you to understand that because when you read through Isaiah 7 through 12, you're going to read at times and go, well, that doesn't sound like for them. That sounds like for us. Well, that sounds like for them, but that's them. That's somebody later. And it makes it a little difficult sometimes to unwind exactly who is he speaking to. Well, Isaiah is always speaking to his contemporaries, always. Everything he writes is to preach to the people of his day. It's just that at the same time he was preaching to you. And he may not have always been aware what was for you and what was for them and what was coming and when was it coming. And so sometimes that makes a book like Isaiah a little bit difficult to unravel. But I just want you to understand that Not everything Isaiah saw fully pertained or was going to happen in his day. He didn't know that, but he knew it was coming. He just didn't know when. And you're going to see a lot of that in 7 through 12. In fact, uh, I want to show you some pictures of that so you'll see what I mean. In fact, turn to chapter 8 and listen to what Isaiah says. You'll, You'll see a picture, verse 16, that Isaiah began to understand not everything here was for him. 
Look at 8.16. Isaiah's been preaching here. You're, we're going to get through this in a couple of weeks. But he gets to a point of frustration where nobody's listening. And in 8.16, Isaiah says, Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. You know, what was Isaiah saying there? Basically this. I've been preaching, I've been preaching. In other words, Isaiah said, I tell you what, take my sermon notes. Go stick them in a Rubbermaid tote and bury them in your backyard. Until we get to the next generation, somebody will finally listen to what this says. That's sort of what Isaiah is saying. These people won't listen. Bind it up, put it up, package it up. We'll put it away. Right now, they're not listening. God's ignoring them. This will come at a later time when some later generation will pull this out and see it. And it will make sense to them and they will listen to that and believe it. So you understand that Isaiah had a sense that even what he was preaching, though he meant it for his contemporaries, he had this idea that it wasn't all going to sink in now. Some of it was coming a little bit later. He binds then the future with the present sometimes. Look at chapter 7, verse 10. This one will be another one to point that out to you. Chapter 7, verse 10. The Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For behold, the boy will know enough, enough to refuse evil and choose good. The land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Now well, that's interesting. God's coming to Ahaz, and as we read in verse 9 a moment ago, he's going to tell him, you need to believe or you're not going to make it. And then God sort of gives Ahaz a blank check. God doesn't do this very often, but he does to Ahaz. He says, I tell you what, ask for a sign. I don't care. Pick a sign. Any sign. You want elephants to fall from heaven? I don't care. Pick a sign. Anything you want to happen, it'll happen, and I'll prove to you that I'm going to do what I said. But Ahaz, in his arrogance, does not want to trust God. Ahaz already has a plan, so he sort of piously says, no, I will not test the Lord. Ahaz, I mean, Isaiah gets mad and says, you know, you, you arrogant thing. How, how dare you test the patience of my God? You know, here God's really reaching out to you to try to give you what you don't deserve, and you're throwing it back in his face. I can't believe you would do that. So, verse 14, he says, I'll tell you what, God is going to give you a sign, Ahaz. And here's the sign God will give you. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel. Now, that's a sign for Ahaz. In fact, verse 15 says, this child will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So that sign has to be for Ahaz's day. It has to be, or it makes no sense. There's going to be a child born. You're going to call him Emmanuel. And before he's old enough to know the difference between good and evil, Samaria, uh, Israel, Aram, they're going to be dealt with. So this is a sign for Ahaz. Yet, you're familiar with verse 14, because Matthew, reading along through Isaiah one day, picks up on that and says, oh, that's not just for Ahaz, who's that for? Yeah, that's for us. He, he saw Jesus in that, a virgin with child bearing a son whose name was Emmanuel. And so you understand then that there was sort of this dual fulfillment going on at the same time. And we're trying to pick up on both of them. I'll give you another one. Look at chapter 9. This is still part of the same segment. Chapter 9, look at verse 6. This is another one you're very familiar with. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now part of that we've seen. What part of that did we see? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. That we saw. The rest of it, we've not yet seen. We're, we're still waiting for that. The government to rest on his shoulders, right? We know he was wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. But we have yet to see the increase of his government. We've yet to see him reigning on David's throne. We've yet to see this going on from then on and forevermore. So there again, you get that sort of mountain range look. Where part of it we've seen, part of it we've not seen. And go even to chapter 11, chapter 11 of this same segment. 
Chapter 11, by the way, is just carrying you a little further into what we just saw in chapter 9. That this shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He'll delight in the fear of the Lord. He'll not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. He's going he's to rule perfectly. And look at verse 6. The effect will be the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. We had not seen that yet. So Isaiah is preaching to his contemporaries, but he's talking about stuff that even we've yet to see. Stuff that has not even yet been fulfilled even in our day. So I'm just telling you that because I want you to understand that in one sense, Isaiah is preaching to that which directly relates to the people of his day, but at the same time, he's talking about that which relates to us and even beyond us. And the reason it's important for you to understand that is because Isaiah 7 through 12 is not just history. He's preaching to you today. In fact, he's even overshot you a little bit. He's even preaching to people beyond you. I mean, the Lord may return tomorrow and we see the fulfillment of chapter 11, but that's still yet future. This is relevant. This is contemporary. This is now. This is the timeless word of God. This is not something that we just back up and say, well, what did he mean to the people of his day in that culture and in that setting? And certainly that's a question we want to find out. But you can clearly see there are things that Isaiah preached here that he never saw in his life. Some of them we've seen, and some of them we've not even yet seen. This is an always present message. This is where we talk about the omnipresence of God, that he's all present. How do you write, how do you preach to people in every generation and preach to them through your word as though you preached it that day brand new and fresh? Well, that's the word of God. So this segment that we're about to study, this is not just a segment where Isaiah preached to Ahaz, and you can learn a few life principles from what he said to them. This is a segment in which Isaiah is preaching to you. He's preaching directly to you right now in your day. And he's even preaching to people who have yet to come. So we understand that reality. So what is the point of 7 through 12? I want to give you the overarching idea and then we'll begin to work our way through it. Very simply, if you want a theme of these six chapters, 7 through 12, it's this. That the remnant will return and rejoice. That's what 7 through 12 is about. The remnant will return and rejoice. I would draw your attention one more time to Isaiah 6 and that last verse in Isaiah 6. Remember, God commissioned Isaiah to go to hard-hearted, stubborn, blind people, and he told him they're not going to get it. And Isaiah said, well, how long do I have to do this? And God said, well, till they're all dead. I mean, that's the call. But there was good news in Isaiah 6, 13. Yet, There will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. He told Isaiah, you're going to preach, and 90% of the people you preach to aren't going to hear it. They're not going to see it. They're not going to get it. All you're going to do is make hell hotter for them. You're just going to intensify their judgment. That's just the way it is. But 10% will get it. 10% will respond. Now, they're not going to have it easy. They're going to be subject to burning. They're going to walk through the fire, but they will survive, and they will return. In many ways, Isaiah 7 through 12 is their story, the story of the remnant. But it's not as though they're the only remnant. We're the remnant. We are those of the grand scheme of the population of the world, the people who don't believe in, in the Lord, but we do. We're the remnant. We may also pass through some fire. We may also pass through some testing. Yet, the remnant remain, and the remnant end up rejoicing. And so the segment here, 7 through 12, is a sermon from Isaiah to call the people to be a part of the remnant. To call the people to pull yourself out of the majority. Pull yourself out of the flow. I don't know what it is about human peer pressure where we all just want to gravitate to where we stand with the masses. That if, you know, the bulk of people agree with it, then we just sort of want to jump right in that crowd because somehow being that odd duck, being that, you know, swimmer upstream, all of that seems foreign to us and harsh. And so we're, we're really more inner tube people than we are swimming people. Just let me jump in with everybody. And that's a dangerous place to be. Isaiah is calling his people to be part of this remnant. You need to get out of that flow. 
You need to come out from the midst of this wicked world, and you need to go upstream and go a different direction. And this is not just the call of Isaiah. This is the very call of the gospel. Jesus said it, Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. I'm always liking that passage to, I call it either the loop, you know, or the business district. And uh, you know what it's like when you go to Lubbock. You can either cut off and go through uh, 19, and you can go up, you know, 19th Street, and you can go through all of that tight traffic and all the stoplights, and you can go by the college, and now they're even working on it there, and it's down to one lane. You go by the hospital, and it's crowded, and it takes forever. Or you can get on the loop. And you can jump on the loop, and it's wide, it's three lanes, and people have their cruise control set, and you can just zoom right around all of the construction and all the stoplights and the business districts and all the school zones and all that, and you can just get around, and it's real easy. And there are so many people that try to live life that way. I'm just going to jump on with the masses. I'm going to get on the loop. I'm going to set my cruise, and I'm just not going to think about anything, and I'll end up at my destination. But Jesus said that's not the way it works. Granted, that's easy access. The gate is wide. And granted, it's an easy travel because the way is broad. And granted, you'll be there with a lot of people because that's where most people go. The problem is it doesn't lead where you think. It ends up in destruction. If you want to go where you're called to go, you're going to have to pull yourself off the loop and you're going to have to trudge through the narrow way, the difficult way, the painful way. You may go alone. It may be difficult. It may be hard. But that's the one that leads to life. That's the calling to be part of that remnant, to be different to follow him, not the thought processes of the world. And certainly you've seen that already in your Christian life. It is absolutely and totally impossible to follow the dogma of the world and Jesus at the same time. You just can't do it. Churches are are spinning themselves uh, crazy right now, the ones that are trying to do both, that are trying to follow the wokeness and the world's ideologies and at the same time, you know, be loyal to Christ. You, You just can't do it. You have to, at some point in your life, determine, I'm not going to commit myself to think like they think. I'm going to think differently, and I'm going to walk according to him. And if that ostracizes me, makes me different, that's fine. But I'm going to put it all on Christ and say, I'm going to do it your way and trust you and you know, let the world have their thinking. That has to happen in your life, or, or you're never set apart, you're never different, you're never redeemed. And so that's what it means to be the remnant. And Isaiah 7 through 12 is a calling to be that remnant. And I want to show you real quick here, just even in these opening couple of chapters, opening three chapters of this segment, the unique ways in which God is calling men to that. He's doing it in a really unique way. It actually starts in the segment we're going to look at here in a minute with this threat that comes to the nation of Judah and specifically Jerusalem and King Ahaz. And that is that you see there's an alliance forming in the north. Aram and Israel are making an alliance and they have this plan to come in to Judah and overthrow Ahaz and replace Ahaz with one of their puppet kings. That's the plan. Uh, And they want to bring him in. And the Lord is going to thwart that plan, not because Ahaz is such a good guy. He's not. But you'll notice the Lord refers to them as the house of David. He's going to do it for David. He made promises to David that this throne's going to last. And regardless of what a thug Ahaz is, the throne's going to last. So God comes to Ahaz and wants to give him a message. He sends Isaiah out to meet him. And you see this in verse 3. Of chapter 7, when the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Sheer Jeshub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And this is interesting because all throughout the Bible you see many times prophets are commissioned and called to go to someone and speak a message to them. But how often do you see the prophet specifically commissioned to take his son? Well, Isaiah is told, Take your son. And there's a reason for this. That son is an object sermon. And it has no bearing on him being there except for this, the name of that boy. That's all that matters in this point. Sheer Jeshub, his name means a remnant shall return. That's what his name means. Isn't that interesting that Isaiah is commissioned by God to go and preach? 90% aren't going to listen, 10% will. And Isaiah is holding on to that so much that he actually names his son a remnant is coming. Why do you think he did that? To remind him a remnant will return, right? A remnant will return. By the way, God does this, doesn't he? You remember the, the story of Ahab and Hagar and Sarah? You remember how all that worked out uh, or didn't work out? Sarah said, take Hagar, my handmaid. Seems like a good idea to nobody. And so Abraham does. And he goes into Hagar and she conceives, remember, and she has this boy. 
And when she conceives, when she finds out she's pregnant, she starts despising Sarai. And basically, she's trying to supplant Sarai. It's another attack of Satan to supplant Sarai. Uh, you, know, you know, Abraham, be with me. I'm the one giving you a son. What do you want this old woman for? You know, da 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 And Sarai says, this is your fault, Abram. Um, every man's been in that trouble before, right? So this is your fault. And uh, Abraham says, well, then do her whatever you want. I don't care. Just leave me out of it. And so Sarah starts treating her harshly, and Hagar flees. And she goes out into the wilderness, and, you know, she's beside herself. She's pregnant. And God comes to her and shows her a well of water. And remember, she names that well. Do you remember what she names it? Beer Lahoy Roy. Um, it means the one who sees. And she calls him El Roy. That's what she calls God. You saw me. You saw me. And then he says, I want you to go back and submit yourself to Sarah, and you're going to have a son. And I want you to name that boy what? You remember? Ishmael. Anybody want to know what Ishmael means? It means God hears. So here's the point. You say, well, why send her back? Because in a few chapters, God's going to send her away. And Ishmael say, go. Why send her back now? Because for about 13 or 14 years, Abraham's going to get to live with a woman who has a testimony of how God sees. And he's going to have to raise a boy whose name God hears. And that's a constant reminder to Abraham and Sarah for doubting God that he would fulfill his promise and taking matters into their own hands. And so you get to be around a woman who constantly talks about El Roy, the God who saw her, while you're raising a boy named God Hears, knowing that you doubted it, and that's why this whole thing started to begin with. So sometimes God uses these prophetic names as nothing more than a visual reminder of the thing you should have learned. And that's why Isaiah is told to take his son, Shear Jashub, to remind not only Isaiah but Ahaz that a remnant will return. There is a way to survive this. And it is to be God's remnant. He does this from time to time. In fact, Isaiah 10, verse 21, Isaiah will say, A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. So God's going to save the remnant. And so Shear Jashub is a visual reminder of that. And so God's using that in his life. But that's not all. You get down to chapter 7, 14, which we read this a moment ago, in which Ahaz is going to doubt God, and so God's going to give him a sign. And we get the second child of this sermon. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And you know what Emmanuel means. What does it mean? God with us. A remnant is coming, and guess who God's with? Us, yeah, them. That's, that's who he's with. With the remnant. In fact, Isaiah 8 9 and 10, be broken, O peoples, and be shattered, and give ear, all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. So there, in this message of Isaiah, you have two children with prophetic names to show you that it's only the remnant that's going to make it, and God is with the remnant. That's why they're going to make it. But Isaiah's still not done. You get over into chapter 8, in the first four verses. Then the Lord said to me, Take for yourself a large tablet and write on it in ordinary letters, swift as the booty, speedy as the prey. And I will take to myself faithful witnesses for testimony, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. So I approached the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said to me, Name him Mayor Shalal Hashbaz. We nearly named Zach that. For before the boy knows how to cry out, My father or my mother... The wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Now what you're going to see is this child is actually the fulfillment of the 714 promise. Only Isaiah doesn't name him Emmanuel. Isaiah names him Meir Shalal Hashbaz. What in the world does that mean? Well, it means exactly what Isaiah was to write in verse 1. Swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. And it's a message to those who are not the remnant. It is a message to those who do not believe. It is a message that if you are not part of the remnant and God is not with you, guess what? Swift will be the one who comes and takes away your plunder. Speedy will be you, the prey to this one who's coming, namely Assyria. And so you get now a third prophetic child name to teach yet another lesson. And again, he's still not done. You get into chapter 9 in verse 6, and we see it yet a fourth time. Another child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There is one coming who will bring light, who will bring deliverance, who is God in your midst, who will save, and who will deliver. 
But it's this flowing message that you have got to be part of this remnant. God is with the remnant. If you're not part of the remnant, you're carried away. The deliverer is coming, and he's coming for the remnant. He's coming to save them. In fact, this entire segment, I'll show you how it winds up, chapter 12, the entire segment ends with the remnant praising the salvation that they receive from this wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 5 of chapter 12, praise the Lord in song. For he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And so what we're dealing with in 7 through 12, and we'll talk a lot about all those more, but what we're dealing with at its core is this simple message from Isaiah to his people that it is time for you to leave the ideology and the thinking of the world, and it is time for you to trust God. It is time for you to be a part of the remnant. Quit rejecting the Holy One and start rejoicing in the Holy One. Quit despising Him and start seeking Him. He is with us. He will deliver us. He will help us. But you're going to have to trust Him. If you keep insisting upon following the logic of the world and the thinking of the world and denying the logic and truth of our God, this is not going to end well for you. There's only ever been one path to peace, and that is to forsake worldly thinking And trust what God has to say. So the whole segment, that's what we're going to talk about. Namely, messages of faith. Believing God. Trusting God. What that looks like in your life. Why it is necessary. This is the call of Isaiah. So with that being said, let's begin chapter 7. Now this first segment, as I told you, I put it wrong on the screen, but it actually goes from 7-1 to 8-8. And it deals primarily with Ahaz. It's all about Ahaz and the setting that's going on in the days of Isaiah and Ahaz's blunder and how God is using him to try to draw him and show the people what it means to trust God and what it means to test God. Two different things. There's going to be five points in total, but here's the first one. It's the dilemma. We're not going to get to all five tonight. It's the dilemma. Look at the first two verses of chapter 7. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying the Arameans have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Well, we fast forwarded now. In chapter 6, it was the year of King Uzziah's death. That was 739 B.C., Now we get Ahaz, the days of Ahaz. Ahaz took the throne in 735 B.C. Ahaz, unlike his father and his grandfather, was not a good king. Uzziah and Jotham had their issues, don't get me wrong. They they wouldn't deal with the high places, and so they sort of majored in the minors and didn't deal with the major issues of the day, but they still had a heart to seek God and love God and uh, to worship God. Ahaz did not. Ahaz was as pagan as they come. Uh, Ahaz followed pagan kings, pagan rituals. He blew it at every turn. He was not a good king. And during the reign of Ahaz, it actually began during the reign of Jotham, but it really hits full force during the reign of Ahaz that God is about to bring upon the nation the trial of their life. Uh, This is the issue of Isaiah's life that's about to come upon Israel, and it's called Assyria. They are the big issue that they're going to face. Um, Assyria is actually going to annihilate the northern kingdom, and they're going to come real close to annihilating the southern kingdom. But it's going to be the the real issue of Isaiah's life, the issue of the people in Isaiah's day. And so the constant call from Isaiah to his people really throughout this book is, I know you're facing an enemy that is too much for you, but you have got to forsake the temptation to follow your own logic, and you have got to start trusting God. And that has been Isaiah's message from the very beginning of this entire dilemma. Now, The dilemma doesn't actually start with Assyria. It starts with two other nations. One is Israel, and the other is Aram. You know them today as Syria. So you remember under Solomon's reign, everything was good. Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam becomes king. You remember this? And Rehoboam is sort of arrogant, and the northern kingdom, northern tribes, ten of them come down, and they want, they want Rehoboam to sort of lessen the, you know, the taxes and the hardship. And Rehoboam says, no, I'm going to be twice as tough as my father was. And so ten tribes of the twelve defect. It's basically a little civil war here. And ten tribes go north, and they say, we're done. We're not going to serve you anymore. You're not our king. Two tribes stay in the south. 
Uh, and that becomes the nation of Judah in the south, and it becomes the nation of Israel in the north. And they are separate kingdoms now. Um, and so you have Israel in the north, and then you have Judah down here. And just a little northeast of Israel is Syria. In the Bible, we call them Aram, but that's the other nation we're dealing with. So in the north, you have the king named Remaliah, or Pekah, who is the son of Remaliah. And in Aram, just northeast, you have Rezin. And on separate occasions, both Rezin and Pekah have already attacked Ahaz. They've already attacked Judah. And they weren't, over, they weren't able to completely overthrow Jerusalem or Judah, but they really inflicted harm on them. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 28, this gives an account of what they had done. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram, and they defeated him and carried away from him a great number of captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who inflicted him with heavy casualties. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day. I've been watching a World War II documentary, and they talk about a bloody day was when 9,000 died. 120,000 in one day, all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Messiah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the ruler of the house, and Elkanah, the son second of the king, second to the king. The sons of Israel carried away captive of their brethren, 200,000 women, sons and daughters, and they took also a great deal of spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So they didn't completely conquer Judah, but when Rezin invaded, he carried away a great number of captives, although it doesn't tell us how many. And then when Pekah invaded, he killed 120,000 and then stole 200,000 women. I mean, that's a massive, massive thing that took place. And we're not talking about a day when they swooped in with airplanes and machine guns. I mean, this is, this is on horseback they come in. And so they don't conquer them, but man, they gain massive vic victories. And then Judah, after those things happen, that's what he talks about in verse 1, that they went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it but could not conquer it. Well, that's true. They couldn't conquer it, but they sure afflicted it. That was bad enough. But then you get the news of verse 2. When it was reported to the house of David, and that's Ahaz, the house of David, saying the Arameans have camped in Ephraim. Now, what's that mean? It means, you know, Rezin and Aram, Syria, have now made an alliance with Israel in the northern kingdom. And their armies have joined forces, and they're camping together. And you couldn't whip them when they were by themselves, and now they've joined together. This is bad news for Judah. And that's why it says, his heart, that's Ahaz, and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. And you say, well, what are they coming to do? The intent is revealed down in verse 5. Aram, with Ephraim, the son of Remaliah, has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it, and make for ourselves a breach in its walls, and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. So basically, if you know the setting of the day, here's what's going on. You have Judah and Israel and Syria or Aram. You have these nations over there and some of the other nations of the world. And then you've got this new powerhouse that's coming up, this new up-and-coming nation that's whipping everybody right now. And that nation is called Assyria. And they're really wreaking havoc, and they're, they're a war machine, and they're causing a lot of trouble for a lot of nations. So Syria, Aram, and Israel decide, hey, we're going to have to make an alliance. We're, we're going to have to be able to fight this guy off, and we need to go get Ahaz to be a part of this with us. So let's go into Judah, and let's get Ahaz and say, hey, you join our alliance, you know, subject yourself to us, and we're going to band together so that we can stay off the Assyrians. The problem is Ahaz won't do it. They don't want any part of being with them. So they have a plan. Well, let's just go into Judah. Let's kill Ahaz, and let's set up our puppet king on the throne, Tabil, and then they'll do what we want. So that's the plan. So they've camped together, and the word comes to Ahaz. They've made an alliance. They're going to be in Judah before long, and who knows what they're about to do. They're going to sweep in and kill and take captives and steal women, and ultimately they're going to assassinate the king, and they're going to put their own king on the throne, and... They're going to try to fortify themselves against this new powerhouse of the day, Assyria. That's the dilemma. And as we talk about their dilemma, just pause for a moment and ask yourself, what's your dilemma? What is it you're facing? Dilemmas come in all shapes and sizes. They come in all degrees and durations. But what is your dilemma? That's theirs terrifying, scary. My guess is your dilemma has a little fear that involves it as well because you don't know what you're going to do. And anytime you don't know what you're going to do or how you're going to fix it, well, that causes a little bit of fear, trembling, shaking, concern. Well, here you are. We have a dilemma. Second point you need to see is the decree. 
Look at verses 3 to 9 now. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son Shear Jashub, and again, his name means the remnant shall return, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. So that's pretty specific. What's going on here is this is the water system to the city. And Ahaz, because he believes he's about to be invaded, is out checking the water supply and the water system to find out how long am I going to be able to hold up in this city? How long am I going to be able to protect myself and fortify? Because you know that's what you did in those days. You just ran behind your wall and you tried to outlast them. And so most wars were a, were a war of cutting off you know, supply lines and food and water. And so Ahaz is out here checking all of their water supply to see how they're going to be able to survive once they get attacked. And Isaiah is told to go out and meet him and take your son with a prophetic name. So he does. And the message is clear. Here's what you preach to him. Verse 4, say to him, take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands. And that's poetic language, but basically God just calls those two men burnout cigarette butts. That's what he calls them. On account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Now I know God says what they want to do, how they plan to evil against you, and how they want to come to Judah and terrorize it, and they want to overthrow you, and they want to put their king in their place. I know that. I know these guys and what they want to do. But there is a promise from God here. And that is in verse 7. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. God's not going to allow it. And this, by the way, has no bearing on what Ahaz does at all. Now, Ahaz is not a good king. Listen to 2 Kings 16. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, became king. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and even made his son pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out from before the sons of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Not a good guy. And yet... God, by sheer grace, because of his faithfulness to David, comes to this Ahaz and says, I've decided I'm not going to let him do it. And, and this has no bearing. This is not a conditional promise. This is, they're not coming. I'm not going to let them. I'm not going to let them come in and overthrow you and set up Tabeel. Now, why would God do that? Because Tabeel is not a descendant of David, and God has made a promise. This is David's throne, and you get to stay here. So Ahaz is living purely on grace. I mean, he didn't even have any merit to claim if he wanted to. It is grace, grace, grace. And God is determined that I'm going to protect you. And so he's going to take this situation as an opportunity now to approach Ahaz and say, okay, you haven't been faithful. You've not been a good king. You've never loved me. You've never sought me. I get all that. But I'm extending what we might call an olive branch to you. And I'm saying, here's the deal. I'm going to protect you. Done deal. They're not coming. So let it be written. So let it be done. This is it. I'm going to protect you. Total. I'm just now coming to you saying, how about now you try trusting me? That's it. It's going to be a simple message to Ahaz. How about you try trusting me? I'm not going to let it happen. Now, this is a simple call which God extends to sinners all the time. We, we sometimes think the salvation of God is purely a salvation from hell, but it's not just that he's wanting you to trust him to go to heaven. The call of God is to trust him in all things, is it not? I mean, to trust him in every aspect of your life. Not just to trust him so that you won't go to hell when you die and say, well, I'll handle the rest of it, Jesus. You just handle the hell part. It's everything. Finances, your relationships, how you raise your children. I mean, you name it. Every aspect of your life, he's calling you, trust me. I mean, he's got a plan for all of it, does he not? Trust me. And this is what he comes to Ahaz. I want you to trust me in this. I'm going to handle these guys just... Believe, And I'm going to do it regardless. In fact, God says, these guys, they're nothing. Verse 8, the head of Aram is Damascus. The head of Damascus is Rezin. God speaks of them with such disdain. They're nothing. In fact, in 65 years, Ephraim won't even be here, God says. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. I mean, these guys are nobodies. It's so different. Judah sees them as an unstoppable force. God sees them as two cigarette butts, right? They're just nothing. And I can handle them easy. But there comes a word, not so much of warning, but of just sheer truth to Ahaz. If you, this is verse 9, if you will not believe, you surely shall not last. 
If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. Now, the outcome of the battle does not rest on Ahaz's faith. The battle is set. Those guys aren't coming. God already decreed it. Whether Ahaz believes it or not, it doesn't matter. God has already determined. But the outcome of Ahaz's life does matter. It's not so much the situation as it is his life. And this is true. When we think of the sovereign will of God, you do understand that God's sovereign will is going to be done. Whether you believe it or not. You know, if I ask you, do you believe if Jesus is going to come back? And you say, I don't believe he's coming back. Well, so what? It's not going to affect whether he comes back or not. It's going to have great ramifications on your life, but it's not going to affect whether or not he comes back. He's decreed this. It will happen. So he doesn't ask you for your faith so that his plan can succeed. His plan is going to succeed. He asks you for faith so that you can survive in the midst of it. There's a big difference. And he's asking Ahaz for faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Think about the faith chapter as a whole. If Noah doesn't build the boat, is God going, oh, no, what do we do now? He didn't build a boat. I don't know what to do. Like God can't make giraffes float. I, don't, I mean, it doesn't matter. He's not going to thwart the plan, right? Just because Noah, if he doesn't obey, well, that's not going to mess up anything God's done. If Abram doesn't leave Ur, if Moses doesn't leave Pharaoh's house, if Joshua doesn't march around Jericho, is God up there, you know, wringing his hands going, I just don't know what to do with those walls. Nothing, right? That had no bearing on the sovereign plan of God, but it had great bearing on the men whom he asked to trust him. It made all the difference in their life. God's plan isn't thwarted, but your life might be. And so there's only one way to live this life, Ahaz. In your dilemma, God has decreed, God has made a promise that you need to believe. And he's going to do it, whether you believe it or not. But if you won't believe it, you're not going to make it. You're not going to last if you won't believe. Ray Ortland said this, We need to think this through again and again. Because living by faith in God rather than by faith in ourselves takes time to catch on to. And we lose focus quickly. Conversion to Christ is only the beginning. And how do we learn but in our crisis? That's when God takes the training wheels off our bikes and teaches us to ride like the big kids. God's saying in your crisis, when it counts for you, trust me. I will keep my every promise, but if you treat me as unreal, you will not connect with reality at all. You're going to miss everything if you don't trust me. He goes on to say, am I trusting God right now where it counts for me? That would be in my dilemma, am I trusting God? If we welcome God as our ally and yield to his way, his timing, his control, his glory, he will fight for us and we'll have no regrets. He never lets faith go unmet. But if we set our own terms, we'll fight alone. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Moment by moment, that's the key to life. And that's the point being made here, Ahaz. God's doing what God will do, but what he wants from you is faith. Not faith just to escape hell, but faith to live life. And if you won't trust him for the little things of life, can it really be said that you're trusting him for your soul? I mean, if you won't trust him for your finances, are you really trusting him for your soul? If you won't trust him in your marriage, if you won't trust him in your workplace, you won't trust him in life decisions, can it really be said you're trusting him with your soul? John 3 makes it pretty clear. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light came into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. The problem is that men love evil and they don't want to trust God. You're going to see that in Ahaz next time. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to trust God. He wants to follow his own logic, his own thinking, the pattern of this world. He doesn't want to trust God and because of that, he's not going to stand. Certainly, we are called to believe. Your finances, your relationships, your parenting, life's trials, sicknesses, ailments, your ministry. You have to trust God in those things. The final question I'd ask you tonight before we wrap this up. What does trusting God look like? That's the question. You say, all right, we'll trust God. What does it look like? Well, for Ahaz, what does trusting God look like for Ahaz in this situation? Just do nothing. God made the promise, did he not? I'm going to take care of them. 
What I don't need is you going around coming up with some other plan. Just do nothing. I've told you I'm going to handle them. Just, as we might say, be still and know that I am God. Just wait, Ahaz. Just trust me now. You're going to find out, spoiler alert, Ahaz doesn't want to trust God because he's already got a plan. He's actually got the king of Assyria on the phone because he's going to use Assyria to come in and whip those guys north of him, not even thinking about what it is he's asking. One commentator said it's like a mouse being attacked by two rats who calls the cat for help. I mean, that's what's happening here. So he doesn't want to trust God, but God said, just stop and trust me. That, sometimes that's what faith looks like. You're just doing nothing and waiting. So sometimes... Faith looks like obedience, doesn't it? Noah, build a boat. Abraham, leave Ur. Sacrifice your son. Don't worry, Jesus says, right? What you'll eat or what you'll wear or what you'll put on, that sort of thing. How about when it says, wives submit to your husbands or husbands love your wives? What does faith look like? It just looks like obedience. Because sometimes the world will say, you shouldn't do that. that you know, especially this wives submit to your husband stuff. I mean, you, you ladies have the opportunity to be a walking example of faith every time you do that because the world will certainly tell you you're an idiot if you do it. That just seems backward and wrong. Why would you do that in our world of feminism? Because that's what faith says. Faith that your husband is the all-knowing, super-wise one and will never make a mistake, is that what it is? Peggy, is that what it is? No. It's faith that God will bless and honor your marriage if you'll submit to your husband. That he'll work it out. That God, get this ladies, can actually steer your family in the right direction in spite of the knucklehead you married. That's reality. If you will submit to him. That's God's plan. It's faith. Sometimes faith looks like endurance. Isaiah said, how long do I have to do this? Forever. Just keep doing it. Till they're all gone. Keep preaching. But in all things, the point simply made tonight is, it doesn't matter the dilemma. In their case, it's Aram and Israel. I don't know what your dilemma is. But I know this, no dilemma catches God by surprise. In fact, who do you think raised up Aram and Israel to do this to begin with? Where do you think your dilemma came from? You think, it, you know, this is the one dilemma in the course of human history that God has no answer for. Where did it come from? It came from him. For what purpose? Sanctification? Maybe. Discipline, possibly. Testimony, I don't know, maybe. I, we, how would you know? We don't know. But we do know this. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. If you're not going to trust God in the middle of your dilemma, you're not going to make it out of the dilemma. It's, not, it's never, it's never going to be fixed or better. Because he's the only Savior. He's the only way out. You can't say, well, I'm not going to trust God but I'll trust this, or I'll trust that. Or, well, I hope you like your dilemma. You're not, it's not going to end. If you won't believe, you won't last. Unfortunately, Ahaz is not going to listen to that message. But what about you? I don't know what your dilemma is, but will you trust God? Do you trust God? Do you trust Him for your salvation? Do you trust Him in your present trial? If you don't, we won't last. This life is meant to be lived only one way. That's by faith. Let's pray. Father, we come to you because you are a God, and we praise you, Lord, for simple. That's a simple truth. But, boy, is it profound at the same time. I mean, that's the key to life right there. Um, trust God. Lord, we, we thank you for that reminder. I know I need that reminder. Sometimes we feel like that we give our salvation to Jesus and everything else we have to take care of that I've got to figure out a way to fix this and fix that and handle this and handle that. And there's very few things we face in this life that you haven't given us a command, a promise even, of how to deal with it. You've told us in each situation, this is what I want from you. You trust me, and you trust me by doing this, or in some cases not doing that. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to be people of faith. We understand that in life's trials and dilemmas and hardships, a faith degree is the thing we're trying to earn. And so, Lord, I pray you help us to trust you. To take an example from Ahaz, to take the preaching of Isaiah, to remember again the Holy One. The one whom Isaiah saw on that throne can handle anything. 
the one Isaiah saw on that throne, nothing is too big for him. Help us to trust him. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you even for the dilemmas of life to teach us to trust. And we pray that you help us do it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.